Both sides in Libya's war committed crimes against humanity and war crimes. That's according to UN investigators. They say the European Union was also involved. So who will hold them all to account? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Nick Clark. United Nations investigators say security forces and armed militia groups in Libya have committed a wide range of war crimes and crimes against humanity. They say they have evidence of abuses carried out against Libyans and migrants stranded in the country. Commissioned by the UN Human Rights Council, the panel also accused the European Union of aiding and abetting abuses by sending support to Libyan forces. UN investigators documented hundreds of cases of murder, torture, rape, enslavement, sexual slavery, arbitrary detention, extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances. They found evidence that Libyan authorities curtailed rights to assembly, association, expression and belief in order to ensure obedience and punish criticism against their leadership. And the panel said support given by the EU to the Libyan Coast Guard to intercept migrants across the Mediterranean Sea led to violations of human rights. Well, Libya has had two governments since 2014. A UN-led ceasefire in 2020 created hopes for peace, with both sides agreeing to hold elections. Abdul Hamid al-Libibi has been the interim prime minister of the UN-recognized government of national unity since 2021. He was supposed to be replaced after elections in December that year, but the votes never happened and has been postponed indefinitely. Tensions escalated between rival governments after the Tobruk-based parliament appointed Fatah Bashaga as the prime minister. All right, let's take this on. We can now get the thoughts of our guests. Joining me in Istanbul is Salah Al-Bakush, who's a political analyst and former senior advisor to the negotiating team of the High Council of States, as well as the High Council of State. In Brussels, we have Julien Oez, who is the EU foreign policy analyst and editor of the French Dispatch. And in Istanbul as well is Anas al a founder and director of the Sadek Institute, which is a political think tank in Libya. A warm welcome to you all. And Salah al Bakush, I'd like to start with you. The report really lays out a terrible situation, getting a great deal worse. Well, uh, uh, as far as the content is concerned, uh, I don't think many Libyans or many uh, uh, international observers uh, and human rights uh, activists are surprised by what's in the report. Uh, the new thing is that this comes from uh, uh, a credible uh, source. Uh, a lot of work went to in, uh, into it, and it uh, provides a, a very uh, neat package of uh, facts. But uh, that uh, the EU is empowering uh, some groups in Libya that are committing uh, crimes and so on, not only against immigrants, but also against Libyans, uh, especially uh, uh, people with the poli political views and women. Uh, that's not new, so I'm not really uh, surprised. Uh, Julian, we'll come on to the criticism directed at the EU uh, in a couple of minutes, but First of all, in general terms, this report, how serious do you think it is? I mean, I think anything that describes any form of human rights abuse is incredibly serious in general. Whether, as Chaloka Bayani, you are or you are not accusing the EU and the member states directly, if you look at our fundamental values, which of which human rights and human dignity are part of, it's very, it's very serious to hear that any funding, any equipment, and anything provided by the EU is going to actually fund these. And it raises questions of where are we in terms of accountability on the support provided to achieve a mission that's not being achieved. And on top of that, it's being abused and misdirected to cause human suffering. And I don't think I need to exactly underline that I don't think anybody in the EU would be happy to hear that the funding being provided by the EU is being used to harm Libyans or migrants of any kind. And it's, a, it's an awful thing to hear. 
Right. I'm not, of course, we must make clear that the report isn't suggesting the EU is committing human rights abuses, yep. but it, it it's points out that the EU funding is aiding and abetting human rights abuses. Uh, so, Julien, just tell us a little bit more about how that might be happening. I mean, there's a... There's always a risk when you're providing funding outside of the EU where there are different regulations, there are different processes for tracking expenses. And on top of that, when there are weaker governmental structures, I mean, uh, Libya uh, has been in a very tough situation for a while now. And the problem is that when there are weak governance structures and when there are weak institutions, which is de facto the case here, it's much harder to accurately track where funding and equipment and material is being sent, where it's being used, how it's being used, and what the goal is, because it's very easy to wave one hand on one side and take everything with the other. And it's, it shows that what needs to be done is that the EU needs to increase its accountability and perhaps gets more involved in the processes on the ground to make sure that the funding is being done. However, there should be uh, one quick clarification on this point, though, is that according to Peter Starno, at least, who's the lead spokesperson for the EU External Affairs, um, the claim of the Commission is that the money is not being physically given to partners in Libya. It's actually being allocated and then ex utilized by international partners, including the UN. So we need to go through the entire report with a fine-tooth comb and look at where the problems are, where the money is going, and where the potential, where this tragedy is coming from. Yeah, Anna, so where do you stand on this? So it's interesting what, uh, what Julien was talking about there, that Peter Stanner, the European Commission spokesman, if you just go through what he says, he, he's refuting these claims that our money is going to finance the business model of the smugglers or of those who are misusing or mis and mistreating people in Libya. He says, the spokesman says, it is quite to the contrary. Most of the money goes in order to take care, to take care of these very people, the migrants. Uh, how do you assess the whole situation? How do you assess the EU position uh, in all of this? Regretful, to say the least. I think nothing could be further from the truth. If you go to the report itself, it talks specifically about members of the Libyan Coast Guard, uh, such as Bija, a, a well-known human smuggler um, who has now been part of the Libyan Coast Guard formally as part of that formal institution. Uh, so he's definitely received um, institutional funding and work, uh, institutional uh, material from the EU. Um, but the report actually details that it's the relationship between the EU on the one hand, the Libyan Coast Guard, and then the trafficking networks that work at the heart and have compromised the work of the Libyan, com uh, of the Libyan Coast Guard, not only for the last year, but for the last several years and over several governments. And I think that's where this report, for me at least, doesn't even go far enough. And one of the reasons why it doesn't go far enough is that if you look into the very details and the methodology of this report, it says that we, for a fact-finding mission that wasn't able to go and access uh, detention sites in Libya, wasn't able to access southern Libya, which is the point of departure for a lot of uh, uh, migrants and refugees who first enter into the country, this report wasn't able to, even to, to establish the hardest facts on the ground. So it doesn't go far enough. And it's only able to assert things that it absolutely knows on paper. And what we absolutely know is that there is indirect, and even at this stage, direct support coming from the EU. But in my mind, it doesn't call uh, things by its real name. There are still facts that have been left uh, behind. It's a seven-year report, so it starts its timeline in 2016. It predates this latest government of national unity that was established in 2021. And it's actually quite flattering for individuals like Khalifa Haftar, who is the principal actor that has led many of these war crimes, who kind of gets off scot-free for, uh, for, for the, the war that he launched between 2014 and 2018 that would take part in this, major war crimes investigations. And remember that it was the ICC Prosecutor General who actually visited Tripoli in the last several months and shook hands with Khalifa Haftar. So there should have been, at the very least, a, a, a deeper message coming from this fact-finding mission report. The mission's mandate might end this month. So for me, not only does it not go far enough, it lets individuals get, get off kind of scot-free as well. Salah al Bakush, do you think the report goes far enough? No, it doesn't. Uh, you know, I was asked uh, yesterday, I think, or, or something like that. And I said, uh, oh, it's going to go into a drawer and nothing is going to happen because this is the same situation we are in today uh, uh, has been happening for a while. In 2017, I was kidnapped and I was put in a room with no windows, with uh, no sanitation whatsoever, never left the room until we escaped. 
and all the equipment that we were given, you know, the uh, uh, the mattress, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, other stuff in there, was uh, 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 marked with the, uh, the uh, International Organization of Migrants and so on. And the, uh, and, and the compound, we figure out, later on, it was a, 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 a legal immigrant uh, station. So, uh, so th this is known. Italy knows where the money goes. And it knows who are these people, who these people are. So there is uh, n n nothing uh, mysterious about, well, uh, you know, there is uh, uh, a government and the government has no institutions and it's very hard to know where the money goes. Uh, Italy knows, as part of the AU, there is no AU policy towards Libya. France is, is doing whatever Egypt and, uh, 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 and the UAE uh, want. And Italy, as long as you stop the uh, immigrants and keep uh, Eni in place, we don't care. So, so that, that's, so, Salah, that's so that, the that's way the it goes. So that, that's the bottom line, is it? That, lay out for our audience, if you would, in that case, why it is that the EU would be enabling this situation. What is their end goal? Uh, uh, well, well for, uh, remember, everybody remembers the EU's operation to, uh, to stop illegal arms shipments to Libya. And Stephanie Williams called it a joke. So this is another joke, this uh, assistance to uh, immigrants and so on, that uh, uh, is done by, in the name of the AU and so on. Nobody knows what goes on with this money. It, uh, uh, some countries, uh, the Italy, uh, provides to uh, some uh, units of the uh, government in Tripoli, and we know that uh, these units are uh, uh, under uh, the uh, protection of some other groups that are very unsavory. Italy knows that, the Europeans know that, but they have no policy on Libya. That, that, that's uh, very clear since 2011. And Julia, this is all done with the intention of stemming the flow of migrants into Europe. I mean, that's a... Sad reality is that the so-called uh, migrant crisis did have a big impact on how the EU reacted to a lot of these things, and also the developmental situation of the EU means that, sadly, it's not as effective or, or able to actually do what it needs to do in many situations. And on top of that, you have the discord internally with states such as Hungary, Austria, and very often Poland, who want to have very aggressive positions that block migrants as much as possible. And honestly, I think, I mean, I agree with the uh, other panelists here that we do need to be doing a lot more to actually find out what on earth is going on all the way down. And the reports need to be more robust. And until they are, and until we have more information, until we go as far down as we can, as deep as we can, unfortunately, the reality is that we're not going to really see a bigger reaction from the international community because you'll have people who will obfuscate, you'll have people who will claim innocence, you'll have people who claim, you know, ignorance in many cases. And the problem is, as has been said already, there's, we need more information. We need more missions dictating and we're explaining and investigating exactly what has happened, exactly where it's happened, exactly what funding has been used, and then figure out how to stop it because it's, it's criminal. And it's uh, in many ways, it's uh, negligent that the people working in Libya have allowed this to happen, that funding and equipment is being used to commit what are very rightly being called crimes, crimes against humanity and crimes against migrants. And it's, I dare say it's a sad byproduct of the increasingly polarized nature of the world that's actually preventing more effective action in these domains and in these topics. And it's, uh, there's no words to express how awful this mm -hmm. is, no right. matter how much we try, All honestly. Right. And as uh, we talk about accountability, indeed the report that talks about accountability, especially for the Libyan authorities. But what about, uh, let's, the last question on the EU now, we'll move on. 
But the, what about the European Union and what about the international community? What about accountability there? I think that this, because of the nature of the European Union, it's trying to seem like it's a multilateral body that functions uh, in complete harmony. But the reality is that its own member states undermine its actions. Now, to be very, very specific about this uh, and to be quite blunt, my sense is that given my knowledge and, and I'm sure the other speakers, their knowledge of previous UN panel of expert reports that go into great detail about the role of states and the role of individuals who are, um, you know, who, who are essentially aiding and abetting uh, and ensuring the, the perpetuation of wars, of crimes against humanity and war crimes. This report is far less uh, in substance and far less in detail to the other reports. So it's not a question that other reports were lesser and this is the kind of the pinnacle. This is a lot less, a lot lighter in, in my view. So my sense is that someone is dragging that pen. And the reason is, is that so it comes on to what Julian was saying around we're having to go further and further deeper. Well, the fact is that the further that you go and the further that you investigate, you find that in Libya's case, that you're looking into the activities of states and not just some petty thugs uh, and some two-bit criminals that have been supported by the EU, but actually member states and UN Security Council members that have actually been involved in these crimes. Now, Julian has rightly pointed out that the, you know, the, the, the international community is divided. I mean, certainly when you look at the UN Security Council, Russia and the US, their position is divided. But let's not go so back uh, in, in, in the past. In 2019, both of those states gave implicit and explicit green lights to Khalifa Haftar. The Trump administration gave Khalifa Haftar a, a green light to commit the war crimes they're now investigating. And Russia's Wagner group that are detailed in this report, who continue to maintain their presence on the ground, were activating, operating, and actually conducting many of those uh, war crimes that are actually detailed in this report. So whether we live in a divided world in 2023 or a unified world in 2019, the very same things happen. Now, because it, it falls short of being able to call for uh, call these abuses by their name, I have absolutely no faith that the UN Security Council members themselves or EU member states are going to do anything to actually look to call for any kind of action to right those kind of wrongs. Because righting those wrongs requires not only the kind of soul searching to look into what's happening in Libya, but it requires that those member states to be honest about their own actions. Many mm. of those member states are still acting on the ground. So that's why I say that there's, and I, and I began this by saying that someone is dragging that pen. It hasn't gone far enough because if it went any further, we'd find the names of the member states of the UN Security Council and other individual member states of the EU that our other two panelists have, have already detailed. So for me, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Do, do you think, and as it will go further down the line? Absolutely not. There's, mm. If the trend continues in the way that we've been looking at it over the last several years, and Libya should be looked at as the kind of example, the petri dish, if you may, of where states are experimenting in not just brutal war crimes and crimes against humanity, but they've perfected this. They've mastered the art of doing it through plausible deniability. You don't have to go there yourself. You can hire some two-bit militant and militia to do your work for you, or you can hire mercenaries. But no one sends formal militaries there. No one sends in the weapons that were used to kill on official planes carrying the, the, the flags of their own countries. They use, they use smugglers to do this. I mean, Libya is a smuggling capital. The smuggling networks that we're talking about are actually used by members of the international community. So again, they've perfected and mastered the art of plausible deniability so that when we get to the critical stage of saying, how could this happen and who is responsible, they can put their hands up and say, well, it wasn't us. And you have no proof, no definitive proof or direct proof of being able to say it. And that's what their support done. I mean, it's, it's really... It's that mastering of that kind of art of warfare that has broken the back of these kind of fact-finding missions that, it, as, as Salah mentioned already, it's either going to go into a draw or you can pull out last year's version and go, blow off the dust and give it to me again. Because the same individuals that are there that are being detailed as war criminals today, they're having their hands shaken by the ICC prosecutor general Shook, the man that is responsible for so many of these war crimes. He shook his hand. The UN envoy last week on French television said, that he would support a candidacy for presidency by an individual that is detailed as being a war criminal in this report. So I don't think that we're going to get any... There's no nothing positive right. to come from this. It is drastic, to say the least. But calling things by their real name is only the beginning, and you have to continue to do that. All right, well, let's turn focus specifically within Libya itself, because the report does talk about how the authorities there have committed a wide range of war crimes and crimes against humanity. And the point is, Salah, 
and that's what all of you have been alluding to, that nothing is going to change until the, the political situation within Libya does and stabilizes. But of course, but, but how, how would the uh, situation uh, stabilize when you have uh, things that make Libyans lose faith completely in the, in the, interna and the, in the uh, international community? I, I give you two examples. Uh, a, a few days ago, we had uh, we saw a picture of the Under Secretary of State uh, of the U.S. shaking hands with Khalifa Haftar. Khalifa Haftar, the panel of experts, this report, uh, uh, many reports talk about w what he did. He was indicted in a U.S. federal court. Not only that, uh, three years ago, the mayor of Benghazi was kidnapped. And everybody condemned the act. A few months later, there was a picture declaring that Haftar has decided to release him. Nobody knew where he was. Nobody talked about it. And now Bethelli talks to France 24, I think, or somebody, and he says, well, Haftar has to be allowed to uh, run for uh, president. So what would the uh, Libyan people do? They just lost faith in the international community. And I think right now they, they, they may really consider uh, uh, basically keeping the way, uh, the way things are better than the consequences of letting uh, Bethelli, who's now uh, uh, backtracked on everything, and decided to use what's uh, the so-called powers on the ground to initiate elections. The powers on the ground is another name for these people that are in the report. Julia, the, the point is that nothing will improve until the political situation does, but how do you resolve yeah. this political impasse between the two sides? And how much responsibility can we keep leveling at the international community? Because it is an incredibly challenging situation. It is incredibly complex. There is no easy answer, as we've been talking I mean, about the, and alluded to. What, what the there is no easy answer, it's true, and you're, you're entirely correct. And there's also a question, and I've had this discussion with several colleagues, actually, about how there is always this wish in the Western world and in the European Union to take a more active role in helping guide states, allied states and states in trouble through their political developments. But the issue, or even, for example, in the case of Iran, in engaging directly to prevent human rights abuses, but the problem is that the Western world has gotten, let's say, to put it nicely, skittish after the criticisms that it rightly received for its engagement in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and multiple other states in the Middle East. And this does weigh heavily on the minds of Western states. And the issue that we have and the way we need to sort of try to come to a, a better solution is really engaging with the international community in finding a way of actually supporting political development and political restructuring, if needed, or political strengthening of the institutions in order to enable states that need to fix issues that impact their people. But the issue is... In Libya, you would need to have all parties come together and say, yes, we agree to have these states come in and help us, or these institutions come in and help us develop our institutions. And the reality, we can't do anything without the consent of whatever governments or organizations are already in the ground managing the processes domestically. And while it may be a case that after the civil war, there needs to be a more intensified state building effort, the problem is this all needs to come from the state itself and the people. And I mean, is that there? And I would need to ask my fellow panelists, the other speakers, to give their opinion on this, because personally, I'm not sure the, that wish or that envie is actually there. Okay, well, let's, let's put that straight away. Really let's put that straight step. away to Anas al Gamati. Do you want to come back to that? What are your thoughts? I think it depends who you're calling Libyan. I certainly wouldn't call the cohort of individuals that have essentially monopolized uh, the, the label of being Libyan for the last decade or much of the last decade 
um, and say ask whether those Libyans are interested in investing in uh, institutions that will allow for a peaceful transfer of power. Now, we've seen this film before. The UN has repeatedly since 2015 had its uh, emergency meetings, its crisis talks. It creates these bodies called the five plus five, the one plus one, the orange and the apple, whatever arithmetic you want to go to, and it brings two sides to the table. Those two sides of the table, I don't think, represent... I mean, we're already at the seventh, I think, uh, interim government over the last decade, or the 11th interim government, depends which ones you're counting in terms of administrations. But we're certainly now almost getting into double digits. And at this stage, calling it two different sides, when it's the same individuals that are going around a merry-go-round for the last decade, draws into question how the UN and the international community and the EU are looking to resolve these crises. Now, you have a very simple question. How do we move on from what has been a, a decade almost of turbulence and the recycling of the same of the same names for a, tr a peaceful transfer of power and a fresh democratic start? Well, the same individuals that have been around for the last 10 years, they've had the tools to continue this game. And the UN and the EU continue to give them them tools. Every time they create a roadmap to the elections, they leave the most critical aspects, Libya's constitutional basis and its election laws, to the individuals that hold power today. Okay, How listen, can you I'm just going to jump in there because we're just running out of time, for... Anas. I do apologise. But Salah, I just want to pose a question that Anas uh, just suggested to you. So how do we move on to a peaceful transfer of power? We've got about a minute left. If you could just take us through to the end. We, we, we have to change the people that are in power now since 2014. They formed nine governments. They, w uh, they went through two power-sharing agreements. And each power-sharing agreement, we were promised to create a unity government, government of national accord, government, uh, a, a unity government, and elections and uh, uh, a referendum on the, uh, on the Constitution. What happened? Within a year, the, the agreements collapsed, Parallel government were created, and now we are going back to the same way. And the reason, the reason we are continuing this, because some EU members and some of the international community are supporting these people. Egypt wants to stay with Aguila Saleh and, and Haftar, and the others want to stay with other people, and, and that's why we are sitting here okay. talking about it after 11 years. All right, we'll have to leave it there. A difficult extremely complex situation. Thank you so much to our guests, uh, Salah Al-Bakush, Julian Oez, and Anas al Gamati. Thanks so much. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by just visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nick Clark, and the whole team here, it's goodbye for now.